gentlemen. Our next speaker is Cesario de Medeiros, and his topic is on Africa and court. Africa has been widely acknowledged as the cradle of civilization, but where does it sit in the world of cocktails? A vast continent of diverse cultures, rich culinary history, and huge potential, yet it underpunches in the world of drinks. Here's Cesario de Medeiros, serial entrepreneur, wine and spirits educator, cordon bleu trained chef, and proud African, explains the history and potential of the sleeping giant and how we can unlock it. Please give a warm welcome to Cesario de Medeiros. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's, it's afternoon already. <laughs> All right, I mean, maybe we could come forward, get everyone together if, if that's okay. Yeah, African style. The sound Super. is also much better when you're in the center of the room. Please Fantastic. feel free to move forward and to the middle. Super, thank you guys. All right, thank you for coming out. Um, all right, we're live. So I'm sort of just going to start with a little bit about me, where I'm coming from, you know, before, before alcohol came into my life. So a long time ago, that's a very young Cesario. I started out working in media, running marketing for a big media group in Nigeria. Uh, went on to break a Guinness World Record. I can tell you about that later on. Uh, then I moved into food retail and I uh, worked with Chicken Republic, a really dynamic uh, QSR brand, opened up a few shops in South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana. So that took me, that's sort of where my journey around the continent started. And uh, went on from that to polyurethanes, a very boring industry, it's chemical manufacturing. Uh, and my challenge at the time was to make that cool and uh, create a value proposition for young people. So they're trying to get them interested into, you know, picking a brand of mattress that they wanted to sleep on, which is, you know, I mean, who really cares in the real world? It's about comfort, you know, so uh, that was pretty interesting. And uh, after all of that, I woke up one morning and decided I didn't want to work nine to five any longer. And I wanted to open up a bar completely out of nowhere. You know, most people already have some sort of uh, immersion in the hospitality industry before they decide to go out and do something like this. But uh, I think the influence for me was that my parents were in the food business, so my dad owned a restaurant, so I had been around that. And of course, coming from selling chicken, I thought I could run a bar. So <laughs> that failed, you know, woefully, but uh, it created uh, the opportunity that has brought me here today. And uh, eight years later, I'm having lunch at uh, Dale DeGroff's house in New York, and I thought, okay, this is a really long way from where this journey started. So I'll tell you what happened in between those two points. The first thing was I found out that I had made a really big mistake trying to set up a bar in a market that had no structure. And the biggest gap was that there was no education. So there was no one qualified, you know, to work in a bar. So we had to go far and wide looking for bartenders that knew something. You know, I say now when I look back that there were one-eyed men in the land of the blind because, you know, since there was nobody in Nigeria 10 years ago, you know, uh, anybody with any kind of knowledge was, was fine. So when the bar closed down, it was immediately obvious to me that, you know, what needed to be done was someone needed to put education in place as a structure. And no one was interested in doing that. So I went back to school, went to London, went to wine school, did a, as many courses as I could. A year later, came back and started a bartending academy with friends in the industry who I had made now who had a lot more experience than I did. You know, I was still the marketer who saw the opportunity, but became really passionate about making this a reality. Uh, a few years after, uh, the IGO called and said, hey, you know, we're launching Ciroc across West Africa and we need someone who, you know, knows a little bit more about spirits and can help us build an advocacy program 
and a marketing strategy. And that's sort of where the journey started. After that, I literally expanded the business across the West Coast at jet ski speed. Um, then I thought I could take on distribution as well. And uh, one of the funniest stories was a brand called Funkin. Anybody know Funkin in the room? So uh, I signed a contract with Funkin in London to distribute Funkin in Nigeria. And the one thing that I didn't think about was that it needed to be stored in a temperature-controlled uh, warehouse. So three months later, all my product exploded. <laughs> And uh, that was the end of that uh, adventure. But the lesson from that was more that uh, the industry wasn't ready at the time for, you know, purees or liqueurs or anything because it was still really in its infancy. Uh, and I mean, I'm just running through there are lots of things that happened in between these. So AHL then became a really well respected marketing agency because we focused just on spirits, uh, did a lot of advocacy work, and uh, more interestingly, two or three years ago, uh, created a TV web series for the industry, and the idea was really to promote education, because this has been the one thing that I have been most passionate about, and uh, it has succeeded in doing that. It's a reality TV show, it's online web series free to watch called The Barman TV, and since that happened, we've had three bartenders out of sub-Saharan Africa. Up until now, it's really only been South Africa that's been represented on the global scene. You know, we've had a bartender go to Havana and come third in the Havana uh, rum competition. We've had one go to France and win a competition with Remy Martin. You know, I just got great news yesterday that another bartender that I had the Fort, good fortune of mentoring, you know, just qualified for, as a finalist for Bacardi Legacy as well, which is the first time that we're having someone from, you know, the other side of the continent making it out there on the big stage. So it shows that education is really the key. And I'll speak a little bit more about that. Uh, and now, last year, I almost had a burnout and I decided to take a year off and uh, go learn how to cook. So now I live in Brazil, writing a book on the industry, and I'm going to share a bit of that information with you today. So I've got a little bit for everyone because I know it's a mixed audience. Uh, for the bartenders in the room who are more interested about, you know, how can ingredients from Africa give me a competitive edge in my bar, you know, I'm going to share a little bit, uh, you know, of heritage spirits and fruits for business owners who are looking for how to get their product out there, which is a conversation that I've been having for the last 10 years with many different people. I'm also going to share some tips. They're all going to be fused together, so you'll have to distill, you know, as we go along. Okay? Super. So I think I touched on that. So the first big, the, get the elephant out of the room, <laughs> is that there are 54 countries in Africa. Now, I know everyone in this room knows that, you know, but uh, <laughs> I'm just stating the obvious. I have met people who think that the continent is one country, you know. Uh, going on from that, it's actually a huge land mass. It's bigger than China, the USA, and India all combined, okay? So, and so beyond being so big, it's extremely complex. Um, I'm going to start with the story because uh, I'm a diehard uh, Afro, Pan-Africanist, yeah? And uh, this also comes back into sort of marketing strategy for the continent. And it's a story of Mansa Musa. Any, every, anyone here know Mansa Musa? Yeah? Everybody know? Okay. So Mansa Musa was an African king. He was a king of the Mali Empire. And in 1320, 1324, he went on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And uh, it's 
the only time in history, you know, and for, for, the, for 10 years after that pilgrimage, the price of gold, you know, took a plummet because of how much gold he distributed on the journey. I mean, we're talking 60,000 people, everyone carrying 1.8 kilos of gold each, camels with up to 100 kilos of gold, you know, and um, I'm saying this to sort of illustrate two things. One is the, the affluence of the consumer on the continent still reflects in this sort of behavior, you know, dashing out, you know, gold. And um, also that, you know, there, there is, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's deeply cultural, you know, uh, uh, to, to the way that, you know, luxury marketing is sort of taking a, it's very, very different when you talk about luxury marketing in Africa and anywhere else in the world, you'll see on, on some of the slides that I have coming up. So why is Africa an important market? Pretty obvious, you know, it's a massive territory. Right now, 800 million consumers, another 85 million coming um, to LDA by 2028. And of course, billions, billions of dollars on the table. But this is the picture that comes to our minds, you know, as uncomfortable as it is when you think of Africa, you know. Uh, I've heard many things and I had, you know, people ask me, oh, you guys ride on donkeys? Do you, do you go to school on an elephant? You know what I mean? And these are honest questions. They're not, they're not uh, no one's trying to hurt you. They really actually do think that, you know. I've had people in Brazil ask me this question, you know, which is really shocking considering how connected the continent of Brazil is to Africa, you know? But this is definitely not the consumer we're talking about. I think that poverty is overreported on the continent, and uh, I've had the opportunity to travel, and I see that poverty is also underreported in the West because, you know, I, I see that there are homeless people everywhere that I go, San Francisco, Sao Paulo, you know, but that's not what you see. The picture you see of the other part of the world is, you know, uh, skyscrapers and, you know, so we can sort of understand that the media does contribute to this. This is the affluent African consumer. In his opinion or her opinion, you know, this is entry-level luxury. This photo is probably somewhere, uh, this was taken in Abuja and, uh, you know, this is sort of where luxury starts. The Bugatti Veyron is I'm not a big car fanatic, but I know there's only 500 of these in the world. And uh, yeah, this, you can see the contrast, <laughs> you know, on the other side of the pond. So um, through the presentation, I'm going to pause. If you take some pauses to ask some questions as we go through sections, because it's a lot of content and I don't want you to get lost. So I'm going to talk about any questions up to now, or can I carry on? Yeah. You were saying that uh, a lot. Of, oh, sorry. <laughs> you were saying that a lot of consumers are reaching LDA. What is LDA? Legal drinking age. Right. So we're going to have people coming into 18, uh, another 85 million consumers in the next 10 years. So big, big market. Trade at the moment. Again, all of these are my thoughts. I stand to be corrected, but you know, I've spent time in the market. Um, it's a lot of product dumping. Product arrives in containers, gets shipped to an open market that looks like this. Looks very chaotic. Doesn't look like there's a lot of structure to it, but trust me, there is. There's a sweet uh, symphony. It travels from these very crazy looking places to outlets that look like this. You know, so big contrast. And uh, the open market isn't left out as well. I mean, the mass market. And they consume spirit in paper bags, you know, sachets. Uh, most popular, uh, one of my favorite is a scotch whiskey that comes from India. You know, very popular in, in Lagos. Scotch whiskey from India. <laughs> Okay, this is also really popular in Uganda, uh, the sachet uh, consumption. So you have contrasts like this. 
picture of a guy pouring a bottle of champagne in the club and uh, another guy sipping uh, his spirit from a sachet. So lots of chaos, but in this chaos, there is opportunity. But before I get to the opportunity, I want to talk through why a lot of people in this room, if you own a brand, you know, aren't already on the continent. Uh, first thing would be language. Now, there's 2,000 plus languages spoken on the continent. Uh, just to put that in context, South America has 420 million people. There's two dominant languages. I know there are lots of languages in South America, but there's two dominant languages. It's Portuguese or Spanish. Uh, the US has one dominant language, English, yep. Parts of North America speak French, you know, but English is dominant. Africa has 1.2 billion people and over 2,000 languages. Now, you might say, well, these are dialects. No, they're not, because uh, we have such a big history with conflict and war that language is a currency of trust. So I, as a Nigerian in a room, you know, somebody started speaking, say I ended up in the north of Nigeria, and I couldn't speak Hausa. It wouldn't matter that I was Nigerian if I couldn't speak the language of the part of the country that I was. I would be considered an outsider, same as you would be if you were in a foreign country. So within my own country, I have a responsibility to learn at least four or five languages to be able to move around and not be, you know, looked at like, where, where are you coming from? Yeah, so language is very important. Culture is very different as well, varies from place to place. One of my favorite cultural bits is communal eating. Uh, how comfortable would you be eating out of a plate with me later on today with your hands? Yeah? <laughs> I mean, this is a tradition. In Ethiopia, they actually go a step further and there's something called gursha, where you actually feed the person. Okay, so, yeah. We're also very religious people. Uh, and you can sort of take that anyhow. The, these are the thoughts of the artist, not mine. <laughs> and uh, there are a whole lot of reasons why you wouldn't be able to make it out there. The regulatory framework is complex, very expensive, it's not constant, varies from country to country. I know when I'm trying to move product from Lagos to Ghana, which is just two countries away, the amount of, you know, I mean, the bottlenecks, the, the paperwork, the politics, it's really exhausting. Trademark laws also vary from place to place. In Europe, I think there's a central uh, registration trademark where I can just go and boom, my mark is registered. Nobody in Europe is going to bother me. Uh, Africa, unfortunately, only has that for the French-speaking countries. The rest of the continent doesn't have any central trademark registration. So that's complex. Uh, goods don't move around as freely. There's multiple taxation. The market is unregulated compared to the US, for instance, where I wouldn't be able to pay an outlet to sell my brand exclusively in Lagos and you know, in most of the markets that I've worked in, I write a $100,000 check and uh, you won't be able to sell any other vodka. You know, it would just be my spirit that you would be pouring. So I don't really need to do much with marketing. I don't need to be very savvy. You know, I just need to have a nice big checkbook you know, and sign these exclusivity checks. In other countries, this would be illegal, yeah? So, on my break, I decided I was going to put all of this into a book. Uh, I'm almost done. I've moved the launch date three times already, but should be out in March 2020. And in it, I provide a map for product market fit, uh, brand distributor fit, redistribution, education as a strategy, which is something that I'm really passionate about, uh, building a brand on a budget, which is something that I have done. And more interestingly, I have done this with brands who had really fat wallets, but didn't believe in the market. 
so they weren't willing to put anything in. And they said, well, if you can make it work with this, then maybe we'll come. And we did make it work, and then, you know, they came. Um, uh, the legal framework, cultural maps, and basically what the future could look like. So I have, um, I'm releasing a couple of articles from the book on Medium. Uh, sorry, a couple of chapters from the book on Medium. And uh, I have one here today that I'm going to share with you. Uh, yes. So we're going to pass, Sand Sandra? It's going to pass out a, a paper if you want to get a copy because I was thinking about the trees. I don't want to print too much. Uh, so I could send an email to you with uh, the link. But I have six copies printed out here. So when the talk is over, fastest uh, fingers first. <laughs> OK. Any questions up to this point before? Hey, hey, Joe, how are you doing? <laughs> Any questions? Great. So the question is, for me, is, is there a road less traveled? Fine, you know, one opportunity is to bring your brand to, you know, the continent, get it distributed. But uh, maybe there's another opportunity. Maybe your craft is still a maybe you know you you're thinking about localizing maybe you're thinking about local content there are so many opportunities and so many ways that you could extract value without going through the cost of shipping and marketing and competing in an already saturated category for instance you know if you make vodka yeah and um, that's what i want to talk about so i'm going to do that by sharing with you three things that are strong themes that continue to run. One is palm wine, which in my opinion is the most popular alcoholic beverage consumed. The second is bitters, which is herbal roots, traditional bitters. And the third, I'm gonna talk about heritage African uh, fruits, lost African fruits, actually endangered African fruits. And uh, you could take some away from that. So palm wine, very popular beverage. Anybody ever? Had palm wine? Yeah, okay. All the people who've been in Africa have, <laughs> including Zhao. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Yeah, fantastic. Um, it's made from the sap of the palm tree, and in this image, that's a palm wine tapper. You know, it's a very serious job because he's responsible for, for getting that uh, sap out. Now, after he's tapped the tree, the liquid comes back down. Some people like to drink it fresh from the tree, where it's more juice. Um, some people want to wait three, four days. Obviously, as fermentation starts to kick in, the sweetness begins to go away. Some uh, tappers will uh, allow it ferment and add sugar to it to get it back to the sweet taste state. And some people distill it. Its distillate is just as popular as its wine uh, equivalent and in many parts of Africa it has many names. So I had the opportunity to meet a palm wine tapper called God Love Alfred in a very, 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 very distant part of the country called Sapele. God Love runs a one-man distillery. He does everything himself. He harvests, he distills. This is his distillery, okay? And uh, the region is, uh, is, is a region that's very, very, this is a really rich part of my country, okay? All the oil comes from here, so it makes sense that he's distilling in an oil barrel, yeah? <laughs> okay, and this is what an artisanal distillery looks like, okay? Um, he explained to me that, you know, this, I mean, he, same process, I mean, the education here, of course, is oral and passed down. He's never been to any, you know, uh, any fancy courses anywhere in the world. He didn't do bar five. You know, he hasn't gone to Tennessee. And, uh, but he knows to take the heads off, you know, at the first run of the steel and take the heart and get rid of the tails, you know. And he also rests his spirit in a canoe. 
you know, uh, just for a few hours before, before he bottles. So I got a little video of God love that I'll share with you. Uh, there's subtitles so you can. They plenty for push we at the top. If then they plenty, are they get every day seven jerry can of uh, uh, for me. If I use that seven jerry can for drum, I go reserve those, those ones again until I can get another seven jerry can again until I get the three measurement, the amount which I need to, to take uh, turn the kai kai. All this work which I'm counting now is uh, the week I'm producing only two jerry can alone, which is uh, two jerry can of kai kai. This two jerry can, I can't dictate say na this, this, but only thing which I know is uh, na one week. Now, that one week which I'm producing is uh, 14,000 naira in a week. The drum. So, basically, it takes him a week to make about uh, two jerry cans. The jerry can is the jerry cans that I saw are about 15, 20 liters of spirit. And for all of that work, so 50 liters of spirit, 14,000 naira, it's roughly. $50? $50? Roughly $50. Yeah, $50. Now, on the other side of the pond, yeah, so God Love is distilling in his very, very artisanal uh, distillery. And in the same city with him, you know, later on that evening, you know, there's a really popular ritual in clubs out there, and it's, it's called the hand wash uh, <laughs> ritual. Zhao, I'm sure you know this, where a bunch of guys order 20 bottles of the most expensive champagne in the club, and uh, they wash their hands with it and send it away. Yeah, so it goes back to the Mansa Musa, you know, uh, story. Uh, CNN says, you know, Nigeria kept popping champagne through the recession, you know, and it goes on, and it goes on. So you've got a really affluent customer base uh, who, if you know, we were able to refine the local offering, would drink more local. So in my opinion, I think this is where the real opportunity is, you know, and no one's tapping into it. Until recently, uh, a brilliant Nigerian lady came up with the idea to repackage Ogogoro, which is a distillate of the palm, uh, tree um, of, of palm sap and uh, this is a brand same liquid same liquid you saw you know uh, from the distillery from from the artisanal distillery so uh, what she's doing is mass buying this very raw spirit redistilling it you know and refining it basically and putting it in a nicer bottle so that it can travel to duty free and maybe end up here. I was hoping I'd be able to give you a taste of this, but unfortunately, I couldn't get uh, them to send any product. Uh, same thing goes on in Ghana. In Ghana, it's called Akweteshi. And in Ghana, the laws are a little lighter. You can distill with sugar cane. In, I mean, it's not that they're laws, but in Ghana, you can distill from, from palm sap and you can distill from sugar cane. Uh, and there's another great brand in Ghana called Nsa, you know, who's doing the same thing. They buy sugarcane from smallholder farmers in the Volta region. They press the juice on the farm. They ferment for seven to nine days. Pot still, they rest for three months. The guy's actually not naked. He just has uh, his pants hanging a little low. And, you know, this is the finished product okay any questions so far no carry on sorry say that again ah okay she asked does the name mean something um i'm not sure but i can find out and i'll let you know and i'm, I'm sure it does i'm sure it does but i i i i didn't i didn't double check on that yeah so collaboration 
is the opportunity. Again, you know, one of my favorite artists, Michael Soy, put it really nicely in this art. Uh, this is not the kind of collaboration that we're thinking about. We're thinking about, you know, more collaborative uh, uh, efforts where, you know, ideas can flow on both sides, ingredients can flow on both sides. I'm going to share a little bit more on, on what I'm doing with that. And uh, together we could, because obviously the West has been making alcohol for much, much, much longer. So uh, there's a lot of knowledge on this side of, of, of the ocean. And if we could create some sort of exchange of ideas, we could tap into the opportunity that exists locally. So, uh, yeah, this takes us into bitters. So a really big trend, another really big trend is alcoholic aphrodisiacs, yeah? Very, 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 very popular across the continent. Um, and they're more popular in their traditional form, which, you know, it's when they're soaked in the roots, you know, uh, in really high proof alcohol, like, you know, Shekpe or Gogoro or Akpeteshi to extract all the value. Until a few years ago when one creative Ghanaian brand, you know, packaged this and uh, it became wildly popular. It's called Alamo Bitters. They sold 13.2 million bottles in Nigeria alone last year. This photo was taken in Togo. I'm sure this ad would never pass uh, marketing regulation in Europe. <laughs> but uh, it shows basically that, you know, this is the positioning of, 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 of bitters and it comes from a cultural background as well. Um, I think that a lot more could be done in this space as well because I know for a fact that, you know, I'm not trashing. I mean, everyone's doing a great job to push this out, but uh, there's a lot more that could be done to make it more authentic. You know, now it's, it's really more placebo because they're not really using the real ingredients. So in 2017, you know, I took a trip, uh, a little road, a long road trip to find out what the real recipes were. And it uncovered so much. I found out that there is a real underground, you know, movement. There are laws, it's regulated, you know, and there's an esoteric element even to making bitters. You know, uh, the two people in the photo with me are considered babalawos. Anybody familiar with that term? No? So they're diviners, basically, but healers, you know, who deal with the trees. And they are the only ones allowed to cut certain trees. So you, it's not free harvest, you know, where you just go and cut everything down. There's, there's sort of like a regulation. And some of the popular ingredients are bar, itako boing boing, it's a bark, ekpo shako, another bark. And to show you the contrast again with how these really raw uh, applications end up being received on the street, this is how Agbo is sold on the streets. Out of a bucket, in plastic uh, bottles, with the herbs showing, you know, but the gentleman is still going to pull up in his Range Rover and wind down and take two shots of that for the road and carry on to, you know, the club where he's still going to go spend a lot of money on champagne. So there is, you know, fusion between understanding that this is deeply cultural, it means a lot to us, and uh, if we could consume this, you know, properly presented, then, you know, that would be amazing. So uh, this cocktail was some work I did uh, a year or two years ago for Negroni Week. Uh, where I made a Negroni using uh, Agbo Ale bitters. Uh, okay, and uh, the last lap is uh, the African star apple. So I'll explain what I mean by uh, endangered fruits. Oranges, tangerines, um, we don't have apples. But uh, your really popular fruits are very popular and very available, and they're commercially farmed. We do import a lot of fruits. 
and including strawberries. But what we stopped doing was growing certain fruits that grew in the wild. You know, they, they were never commercialized. So a lot of them are really now seriously in danger of, you know, disappearing. Uh, I found a tree, or I found two trees last year, and literally it was going from village to village saying, you know, who has an Agualumo tree here? And they were like, oh yeah, there's one man who used to be a teacher. I think he has a tree in his compound, you know? And then we would go and say, hello, sir, do you have a tree? Can I buy all the fruit when the harvest comes? And literally this is how, you know, uh, Agualumo is farmed. It's a really popular fruit, grows in certain parts of West Africa, in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Benin. Uh, it's known by very many names. More popular, the African star apple, Canito. I know that they also have, a, it has a relative that grows in Vietnam, but very different taste. And uh, it's an amazing, amazing fruit. Uh, Steph, do you know the fruit? Yeah? I mean, this is, I don't know what fruit it was for you as, as a child that, you know, if your mom came back with a basket, you would sit down in the kitchen and eat everything back to back and you wouldn't leave the kitchen until there was nothing left. This was what this was for us growing up. So this is what it looks like on the inside. It has seeds, a uh, little white flesh on top of the seeds, which is the sweet part. And uh, the more orangey meat is very tangy, very, very, I mean, it's uh, very sour. So, so you have a nice contrast between sweet on the seeds, sour on the inside. And depending on how ripe it is, you know, then you get more sweet or more sour. Other endangered fruits are chocolate berries, which grows in Ghana, Mali, Togo. We have uh, the custard apple, baobab, which is also really popular, but also endangered, jungle sop. And what I'm trying to say here is most bartenders starting out bartending anywhere on the continent have learned how to make a drink that has strawberries, even though, you know, they don't have access to strawberries. Yeah, so they'll buy strawberry concentrate, they'll buy strawberry syrup and they'll buy strawberries very expensive to, to garnish. So, you know, I, I'm thinking of a time where you could get Agbalumo here the same way I get strawberries <laughs> in Lagos, because if you can get strawberries to me, I can get Agbalumo to you, yeah? And, and that's, that's where I see the opportunity lying. So, I see a lot of VC, JV opportunities uh, not a lot of our spirits are aged, so there's a big gap there, you know, in terms of a barrel, barrel industry. Uh, still building, you can see where that is. Exporting dehydrates and knowledge exchange. Yeah? Any questions up to this point? No? All right. Carry on. So I'll come back to this. So... Once upon a time, you know, um, and maybe it still happens now, people built their plans very far away from the reality, you know, and uh, I think the message is that, you know, the continent is wide, it's vast, and if you're going to, if you're serious about creating a path, you know, and succeeding, then you need to be closer to the battlefield, okay? So, a lot of the... Uh, thoughts would be, you know, I don't have the liquidity to build a marketing effort, you know, uh, or I'm just going to dump my product, which has been, I have experienced, you know, I've worked with people who just wanted a product dump and walk away. Uh, or I don't have a budget for education, you know, so I'm not going to start training bartenders or, you know, I mean, let's just get, get the stuff out there and let's go, you know. Um, those strategies will always lead to, you know, you're not going to get past that first container, you know, if you even manage to sell it. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, we have to build a real strategy if you want to succeed. And if you do, then, you know, there's a big market out there waiting for you. So in looking ahead and reasoning backwards, I think the important thing, uh, an author that I like said, 
uh, what's more important is what you don't know, because you already know what you know. Yeah? So, uh, yeah. And that's it. <laughs> so, thoughts, questions, comments. I hope I didn't rush through that too quickly. <laughs> yeah. If you have any questions for Cesaro, just uh, any discussions, we can all bring it up as well. He's still here and he has your time. Yep. Okay, Angus has a question. Uh, I, yeah, I do have a question. I mean, I, how can we help grow? I mean, bartenders are in community. How can we help grow the community? I mean, I get emails from people saying help, but a lot of the time it's send us products. Yeah. How can we, you know, you talked about knowledge exchange. What is the best way? I mean, are there platforms, websites, sort of yeah. online communities that we can help with? Yeah, so I think, I think your question actually marks, you know, uh, the point is that I don't really think, uh, you know, help is, is a two-way street in that, you know, I think that um, things, even though that I've showed like a really raw side, you know, of, of, uh, of the industry, there's also a really big industrialized spirits industry on the continent as well. There's, Kenya has, you know, massive craft beer scene, you know, that I think is pro extremely amazing. So there's, there's big things happening also, but um, everyone sort of focused on, you know, the big money, you know, items. I mean, the U.S. has a much more evolved artisanal scene. So um, how can we grow the artisanal scene is, is where the question is. And what's in it for you? You know, so, so you, it's not aid, it's exchange, you know. So, uh, I mean, this is definitely one way to get the word out there and get people thinking differently about what the opportunity is. Uh, so thank you, BCB, for the opportunity to share these ideas. Um, uh, another way would be, I mean, beyond that, I'm, I'm hoping that the people in this room go out and interact with three more people each and say, hey, you know what? We were thinking about going to Af We were never thinking about going to Africa, which is what every distributor has told me. Oh, no, I have no plan to go to Africa. But if you're willing to buy a container, sure, we can talk. You know, <laughs> so, you know, um, so to change that mindset and, and uh, invest, to answer your question, Angus, invest in education because that's where the biggest gap is, you know, uh, education, which will be the foundation for building uh, a solid uh, industry. Yeah. So I think, I think that's where the focus should be. Thank you for a great question. Are there any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. I've heard a little bit about the different types of drink, drinking experiences there. And one of the ones I heard about that I would love some more information about is sort of the community-based neighborhood drinking and like people buying beer and wine, et cetera, from the houses nearby, et cetera. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, the culture of what, like beer parlors, basically, community bars. Is, yeah, I just, I hear there's like a, like you were saying, there's a large variety of experiences of how drinks are consumed, thinking about those types of things. Okay. Shabin. You want to add something? I think that's like, you know, in uh, South Africa or other country where we have the Shabin and, yes. you know, they have like the local alcohol, but also the imported one and everyone drink together. Sure, yeah. sure. Okay, so the question was, you know, are there any cultural habits with regards to drinking that uh, are particular to Africa? Is that in different parts of Africa? Around about yeah. it, yes, yes, there are. There are lots. Um, they're religious. They're, there's, I mean, alcohol is drunk for many different reasons. Uh, schnapps, you know, ironically, thank you for bringing that up, is very, very important, you know, uh, in religious ceremonies. Uh, getting married, walking into somebody's house, if you're a very welcome guest, you know, some cola nuts and schnapps will be, you know, shared. So that's a very popular ritual. 
palm wine is also presented when you go to marry your wife, you know. So if I was going to get married, I would have to take certain liters of palm wine to my uh, proposed father-in-law as a gift, you know. So there are lots of cultural uh, occasions where certain types of alcohol are meant to be presented or consumed. And, uh, but across board, I mean, because there's so many different ones, across board, the main occasions would be birth, death, marriage, um, and any other celebration, which I think applies to the rest of the world, <laughs> because we all drink in those occasions, but uh, where it will sort of be different for us would be that there would be a particular ritual you know, with regards to how the alcohol is consumed at the start, and then, you know, it carries on. I hope that does it justice for the other Africans in the room. <laughs> All right. Okay. If we have no more questions, I will... Okay, one more. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the inspiring speech. Um, as you have already shown, Africa is so big, it's like over 50 countries. So what are your advices in terms of understanding Africa, really okay. understanding it? Okay, what's my advice? The question is, what's my advice in terms of understanding Africa? Um, I'm still learning as I travel and <laughs> go around, you know. Uh, it's such a vast space and it's so diverse and it's so complex. So uh, I think the first step would be to travel there. Yeah, that's a good starting point. Pick a country, somewhere where you feel nice and comfortable. Um, have you been anywhere in Africa? Yeah, where have you been? Johannesburg and Tanzania. Very nice holiday locations. So now you need to come. <laughs> <laughs> nice beaches, safari, yeah, yeah, that's the pretty part. So we have to bring you to where the, where the real magic happens. For business. Fantastic. Fantastic. So you're off to a great start, you know, um, and uh, so more travel. That's, that's the only way, really. So you get to get a pulse of, you know, what's really going on. Okay, another question. Hi, uh, my name's Guy from uh, a Prisera Gin, which is the first gin made with African juniper. Okay. Um, and most exactly. people don't know there's an African juniper. And we, um, we made it, we won a gold medal in San Francisco, and we're actually just launched in London. And, Fantastic. And, and one thing I think, which hopefully can be quite valuable, is there being role models of brands which are uh, out there. There was not a craft distill, there wasn't a distillery in Kenya until this year. And now we have juniper that grows above 1,500 meters, Fantastic. which we collect. And I believe this juniper makes a very, very good gin, as, as, as uh, I think there's the proof. But I think you need, uh, there need to be role models and other companies to, to do that as well. And I think that's something that's happening in Nigeria. And yes. I think is, is really going, hopefully, to start a, yes. a very different, uh, different sort of perspective on Africa, which isn't just uh, the normal narratives. If exactly. it's a two-way street rather than just Diageo bringing products to Africa. Africa, you know, we're now served in the Savoy and the Connaught as mm -hmm. one of the most premium gins. And I think that's the first time there's been an African spirit on those that's menus. Amazing. And that's really exciting, I think, for the industry. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just to add to what uh, he said, uh, uh, the grains of paradise in Nigeria are also a uh, main ingredient in Bombay Sapphire. Yep. Anybody know that? that Grains of Paradise in Bombay comes from, the most of it comes from Nigeria. I think Jägermeister takes uh, uh, Blood Orange from Ghana, you know, so, you know, there's uh, a lot, a lot of that is happening already, and now you're taking Juniper from Kenya. And Salim Pepper from Nigeria as well, Grains of Salim, and all around 10 different botanicals. Acacia Honey from Somalia, actually, as well. <laughs> there you go. Super. And I met somebody yesterday who's taking coffee from Rwanda as well, just downstairs. So, <laughs> super. Thank you so much for that contribution. Yeah, no, so I just, uh, I guess the question is, how can we have better exchange between products in Africa? So, 
the, the Prosera is actually distilled in Kenya and yeah. you have a lot of things that you're doing in West Africa. South Africa also has a large movement and you talk a lot about education and, and the book that you've been working on and protection and species. Yeah. Is there a way that these things can, can come together through a platform that you have or through yeah. some of the things that you're already doing yeah. to, to create a different narrative versus just the the babies of famine that you put up earlier for a really yes. positive, sexy narrative like you have now. Yes, yes. so uh, I'm working on that, uh, but I'm just one person. So and I've made uh, this contact with you and I'm, I do that and this is what I'm doing. So I think uh, there's other people as well who are championing that cause. There's people who have gone further than me who've actually started repackaging spirit. You know, um, my focus is more you know, really on creating this exchange. There's people working in locally. So yes, I'm working on that. I was talking about something that I was doing earlier. Um, at the moment, I'm building uh, a platform. I, I have already built a platform. I'm building a tech platform, that's something else, but already building this opportunity to bring and create a fusion. So I'm thinking about uh, speaking with i mean creating the opportunity for funding you know to start with you know uh, there's a rum project that uh sugarcane project in nigeria that i was working on two two years ago that shut down because we couldn't find any vcs who were interested in investing in alcohol so i understand that it's an ongoing conversation i think like i said earlier that it started now you know uh, that was the whole idea of putting these ideas out there if you've got ideas you want to share with me, you know, I'm right here. And uh, this, is, this, is, this is pretty much what, uh, what I'm 100% about, you know, creating that link, you know. And uh, Booze Boss, which is a company that I founded last year, is set up to do exactly that, to help brands on this side who want to move over there, uh, where market entry incubator, basically. So... So that's, uh, I think that will definitely add to, you know, creating that cycle. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so yes, uh, Booze Boss is set up to do exactly that. So if you're trying to get over market incubation and at the same time with the projects that I'm working on with the fruits, trying to get them out there, you know, with the, the African Star Apple. I'm a second phase now on a formula for bitters with that. So that's moving forward and hoping that uh, we should be commercial maybe in about a year. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, I'll ask another question. Uh, I mean, you said it to start off with that Africa is a continent of 1.2 billion people and 54 countries, and yet we tend to lump it together as one entity. What are the, the hotspot sort of countries and places that you know, we could focus on and that have the biggest opportunity to try and raise standards uh, and raise awareness of the skill of bartenders and the power that we have? Okay. Uh, so the biggest, the hotspots with the biggest opportunities in the West would be Nigeria, of course. Uh, Ghana would be next. The Ivory Coast would, you know, I mean, the Ivory Coast would probably come second and Ghana third just because of the size of Cote d'Ivoire. And maybe Senegal fourth. On the uh, east side, Kenya for sure. Would be, you know, would be big out there. Uganda is a massive, uh, I mean, uh, drinking nation. So that would definitely be top. Um, uh, and Ethiopia, I would say, would be an important uh, location to be in as well. Uh, in the south, you know, it's South Africa pretty much dominates that region already. Um, I... I would say Botswana, you know, uh, on that side. Central Africa is a much more complex place to get around. Cameroon is a great market, not as big, not as big, uh, but if depending on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to sell luxury spirits, 
in some of these markets, you might not, you know, uh, be hitting it. But if you're if you're creating a, a local value chain and reinventing with local spirits, then there's a big opportunity because that's mass market. So, so fr from that perspective, I mean, the whole continent, but those will be, you know, the, the main hotspots uh, for me on the West Coast, Central Cameroon, and uh, on the East Side, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia. Yeah? Super. All right, how are we doing for time? Good? Okay. All right, if we don't have any more questions, so thank you very much, Cesaro. It has been very insightful. Thanks. Thank you very much. And also, all of his contact information is still up on the screen. And if you want, come forward to the stage to grab a copy of what he has for you. Thank you.